Okay, now finally about the code. So Rebound is, at first it's open source, it's open source um, really with um, GPL version, so the GNU public license. It's not only floating around in the internet, uh, just like some other, um, let's say, anybody codes in the community, but there is one official repository online on GitHub, and there is a vivid community, there is a forum, um, so this is all part of the open source ID. Uh, the code originally was written by uh, Hanno Rhein, who is now a professor in Toronto at Scarborough in, in Canada. And it's a multi-purpose n-body code for collisional dynamics. Okay, so especially for collisional dynamics. The features are it has an ISO C99 standard programming language. It's the, the backend is written in, in C. That's why it's also so fast. And you can also do it in, in, in Fortran, but it's a fast code. It has a nice Python front end, so you can also use it in um, in a Python script. But you in the back end you have the fast compiled C library. So although you program it in Python, as long as you don't add your your functions in Python, it makes no difference in the in, in in the speed, either if you use the C version or the Python version, which is quite nice, especially if you're doing teaching, for example, and you have a nice, easy to learn scripting language like Python and a high end uh, software integrator package in the back end. Then it's very modular. You can also just use the C library uh, modular, compile it, link it to your own code. Then it's uh, it's paralyzed for shared memory. This is this OpenMP parallelization, uh, which means that if you run it on uh, your workstation and your workstation has more than one core in the CPU, then you can use all of the cores, which makes sense uh, already for smaller numbers of um, particles. And it has an MPI parallelized version, but only for the tree. Uh, MPI means message passing interface. This is a parallelization technique where you, uh, for a cluster, distributed cluster, where you send around your information over the network because you have no shared memory and you have a distributed memory. And this is implemented only for the tree version. You have various integrators, more, to this, more of this later, and you can have active particles and tracer particles where the active particles interact gravitationally and the tracer particles are just put in and are massless. We have, not we, the code has um, support for some collisional granular dynamics. There are various collision detection routines. So for example, you could also study some grain, let's say grain growth or something like this. Um, and it has very, very good documentation. This cannot be overestimated. If you have ever found yourself in an office alone with the Fortran 77 code, which has several thousands of lines and no comments, then you would love the very good documentation, which is also online. Um, then there's one master student working on the GPU support via the open uh, computer language. Um, which comes soonish, let's say. No um, more information about this. Okay, so as I said, it's modular. You can use it as an external library. So you write an n-body simulation with just a C source code. You can see a basic structure here on the, on the bottom green um, panel here. You, you just include the header file. We have, this is C syntax, I don't know if you know C, we have the, the uh, Python example in a minute. You create a, a rep simulation structure by this function, then you have, can create and um, choose an integrator, and then you just integrate. Um, this is the basic structure, um, how um, um, a rebound C program looks like in Python. This is even more easy just import 
rebound. I've got here also numerical Python, but this in principle you don't need this. But you import rebound. You create a simulation by this function. Create an instance of this object, and you can simply add um, particles with the sim dot add. Here we add a um, particle of one solar mass, and then another particle of a Jupiter mass. Add one AU. So this standard uh, units are g equals one and solar masses and AU. Then this function moves it to the uh, center of mass system, and then we integrate for 10 times n and non-p times p. So 10 times pi would be five orbits because one orbit in this units is uh, and one AU would be two pi. So you can use this as soon as you've installed the module rebound and we have put uh, all the documentation that you need and Hossein had made it on, on, on the GitHub repository, the documentation, how to install rebound via pip and the, the Python installer package. Um, you can just use this in your script file or even in your Jupyter notebook. If you look at the documentation that is online, then Hanno has also several nice examples in Jupyter Notebooks. Okay, so you can have different types of particles. This is active particles or test particles. This is, um, is so that uh, a type of the particles with an index which is higher than an active uh, means if it's zero, particles does not influence any other particle. This is default. So this is just a tracer particle. And one means particles with index smaller than an active feels the test particles, and the test particles never feel each other because they are massless. Okay. For example, here in this example at the bottom, we create a simulation. We would add here, say we have two test particles, an active, that would be probably then something like the sun and a, a, a massive planet. And then we add here just test particles with no mass at all and integrate the system. Okay. Well, does this look like in uh, Python here? We set up a simulation with rebound simulation. So this, this is always the same structure. We add a sun, add a Jupiter here at Earth's orbit again, and say, and say we add another 1,000 test particles and add this test particles randomly. If we don't explicitly give a mass here in the sum add function, then the mass is zero. We add a random mean anomaly, so the particles are distributed evenly or randomly, and set the number of active particles, the number of um, interacting gravitationally, um, are only the first two uh, particles here. And you can run the simulation. This is what you will use for the Kirkwood gap example, where you have uh, Sun, um, Mars, and Jupiter, and um, um, as acting as real particles, and then the asteroid belt modeled with some thousands of test particles. So you can identify each part particle uh, exactly by a particle hash. You can add and remove particles throughout the simulation. You can uh, identify particles, that's what I've said. Uh, these are the C functions. It's in, in Python, it's easier. You can just uh, type add and remove. So you can add a particle, let's say at 5.2 AU, and call it Jupiter, because this would be probably Jupiter. You can remove it given with the hash that you gave the particle to identify, or remove it with the index. OK, this is so for the whole structure, so adding, removing the particle, integrating. Now um, I will talk about the modules that are currently available. These modules in, in include different type of integrators, because different type of problems require different type of integrators, then different types of boundary conditions, and different types of collision detections algorithms. Um, okay, so here are the modules 
as they are for the integrators as they are published now in the documentation. There is a new class of integrators that we've been talking about in the last session with Bahid, I guess, uh, for the, the binaries. Um, but these are not officially announced yet, I guess. So the standard integrator in Rebound is this EIS 15. If you don't specify any other integrator, the code just takes this one. And this is a IAS 15, stands for uh, implicit adaptive step size control. This is a 15th order integrator. Um, it's non-symplectic uh, and it's based on a Runge Kutta 15th order uh, integrator. Um, and it's a uh, very high order, of course, 15th order. You may remember the Runge Kutta 4th order. The accuracy goes down to machine precision and you can also use velocity dependent forces. Um, since it's not symplectic, you don't need uh, this um, condition that you have a fixed step size or uh, um, conservative forces that do not depend on the velocity. Mm. So this is the standard integrator. This is also the integrator that you would need if you have collisions, okay? Um, because for collisions, you want an adaptive step size. Adaptive step size means that the step during your integration can vary between larger steps and smaller steps, depending on your current accelerations in the system also. For example, if you think about a, a comet orbiting around in a very uh, um, eccentric orbit, then if the comet is very far away from the sun, you can do large time step because the acceleration is small. And if the comet gets very close to the stars, to the sun, then you want to have smaller step sizes because the dynamic is much uh, faster and on shorter time scales. Okay. So next integrator is the VH fast integrator. It's a second order symplectic wisdom and Hellman integrator. Uh, with correctors, these correctors are required to, well, this is an add-on to the symplectic integrators that we've talked about in the, in the um, theory part. There are corrections to make sure that the system remains symplectic, so to say. And this VH fast integrator is good for planetary system without any collisions. So if you want to study, let's say, the planetary system and you're sure that you have no uh, close encounters, then it's the best choice because this is um, energy conservation, conservative, uh, conserves energy. So, sorry. In principle, this um, VH fast works. Uh, basic idea of wisdom and Hellman integrators is that the planets move in capillarian motions around the sun and the interactions between the planets itself are then perturbations on this capillarian motions. That's the basic idea of a wisdom and Hellman integrator. So you see, as soon as you have a collision where the interaction between the planets cannot be considered small anymore, then this integrator fails. Next one is, is Janus. This is the, the integrator that was added three years ago. It's a bitwise time reversible high order symplectic integrator, uh, which uses a mix of floating point and in integer arithmetic. <clears throat> if you're interested in the details, they are also quite technically, then uh, look at the paper by Rainer Tamayo from three years ago. It's explicit <clears throat> and formally symplectic, and you can change the order uh, between two and ten, I guess, yes. Um, I've got here a nice picture where you see some particles arranged with rebound and uh, these are just, um, you look at the evolution in time and you, on, the, on the first row bottom uh, panels you see the lead frog integrator and on the, uh, on the top panel, on the bottom panel you see the Janus integrator and the time is reversed at t equals 500, because, or not the time, but the velocities are flipped. So each velocity at t equals 500 
is uh, flipped to minus the velocity it has, and you see that the Janus integrator gets back to the initial um, uh, distribution of the particles, while the leapfrog is not accurate enough. Okay, uh, so by using sophisticated methods of floating point and integer arithmetic, this uh, integrator is bitwise time reversible. Um, okay, we probably don't need such a, a currency for all of your applications. Then we have uh, the leapfrog in integrator. This is the uh, very easy, straightforward leapfrog second order symplectic integrator, um, which we will use, I guess, for the curve gaps. Then there is a, a, a symplectic epicycle integrator, which has only a special applications for shearing sheet simulations. This is, for example, if you have a shearing sheet, this is a, a box in a shearing sheet environment, like an accretion disk, and you want to simulate only this patch in, um, in, a, in a disk where the boundaries shear, yeah, um, then you have to use, or you can use this C integrator, which was, which was especially developed for these kinds of applications, for example, if you think about, let's say, collisional grain growth in a planetary ring where you only simulate the, a batch of the ring and not the whole ring. Uh, so it's a very special integrator. Then we have a Mercurius integrator. This is pretty much, I think, the same implementation as, it was, as the C integrator that was um, made by John Chambers from Mercury. So this is a hybrid integrator which switches between a symplectic integrator for long-term integrations. This uses VH fast with Wilson, uh, Wilson Holz, Vincent Holden integrator for long-term integration and switches then for close encounters to IAS 15. So the code or the integrator realizes okay there might be a collision and then we switch to uh, the higher order uh, integrator with adaptive step size to uh, catch the close encounter. Then there are two new integrators that I haven't tested myself so far because they're pretty new. There's a higher order symplectic integrator family uh, after Lascar, Jacques Lascar and Robitel. From 2001, they were implemented last year all right, I guess last year in the paper last year, and um, for example, this is just improved integrated to the VH fast integrators, and you get for the same number of force evaluations, so the same number of calculations of the forces of the right hand side in your equations, up to six orders better accuracy and magnitude. So this is what Hanno found out in his papers. Of course, you have it's not the same computational effort, you need a little bit more computational effort, but you have a much higher order in accuracy. So these Saba uh, integrators are higher order symplectic integrators. I, I don't know which order, but it's probably 11, 15, I haven't can, had to look it up. Then another new integrator is the embedded operator splitting EOS not equation of state in this case, this is embedded operator splitting uh, integrator which Hanno introduced last year and this is a special integrator which is suited for primitive architectures, let's say graphic cards um, or FPGAs, field programmable gate areas where you have not very sophisticated hardware, let's say, with, with um, processor extensions as on a, um, on a CPU, but um, more or less simple um, GPU um, cores, so to say. But I haven't used this either yet. Um, well, I, I think that this is the, um, the next step now that the, the code will also run on graphic cards and so they are implementing new special integrators for this simple, more simple architectures. 
So, so far for the, for the integrators, you can also easily, not easily, but you can add uh, integrators for yourself. Um, uh, for example, if you, there, there's no Euler integrator in it. If you want to add an Euler integrator, it's straightforward to so just add an Euler integrator. Um, but normally, or if you think that the IAS 15 is uh, well, maybe too much for your, too, too, uh, too high accuracy for your problem, then you can also maybe implement a more simple, a simpler integrator. And then there are different gravity solvers uh, for different available, the gravity compensated, gravity none, which means no gravity. Uh, just walk through this fast. We have gravity compensated, direct summation with compensated summation. This is a O an order of n squared algorithm to just calculate um, the contribution for all particles. Compensated summation means that you try to um, decrease the, the, the rounding errors or the summation errors from the floating point arithmetic. For example, if you take your computer and you would calculate these both sums here, then it makes a difference if you sum i over i squared from i from 1 to uh, 10,000 or from 10,000 to 1, okay? This is because of uh, rounding errors or truncation errors more or less. So you have to first start with the smaller values, otherwise um, the smaller values are not considered anymore if you add up, have already added up the large numbers. Um, so direct summation with compensated summation is one possibility to get a higher accuracy for the gravitational forces. Mm. Then you can also do no gravity at all. For example, if you just want to have track forces or something like this, or detect collisions, um, probably not our, our applications, then Gravity basic, this is not the compensated uh, version, just do a direct summation. And then you have this oct tree that I've talked about in the theory session, where we have um, these particles sorted in a tree and have the approximated um, uh, gravitational forces. So this makes really only sense if you, let's say, study. Uh, the self-gravity of a lot of particles. Um, okay, how you choose this? Again, you have a pointer for this to just say the, the ref gravity here is ref gravity tree, if you want to use the tree. And um, in Python, I guess it was a term in Python, then you just say that this string gravity is set to tree, and then the code uses the tree version. Okay, Let's fast switch to the boundary conditions. Uh, as you may know, boundary conditions can be important. Or normally, one has open boundary conditions, but you can also have this shear conditions for shearing sheet, or periodic where particles that fly out in one hand side, uh, on one side, get in on the other one. Um, so here, particles are not affected by boundary conditions at all. This is the default. If you don't declare any boundaries, you just don't have any. We can have open boundaries. So a particle that removes uh, or flies out uh, of your simulation uh, is taken out of the simulation. For example, if you have scattered particles out of let's say, um, a disk or so, then you would use open boundaries. You can have periodic boundaries where the particles are reinserted on the other side uh, if they cross the box boundaries um, and the shearing conditions. There are also, I cannot state this often enough, examples for all of these different modules in the, in the code itself and online. So if you want to play around with shearing sheets, then a good start would be to look at the example shearing sheet. And again, also there's a pointer or a, a switch 
you, know, you choose between the boundaries in um, in the C code here, you choose just via R boundary pointer and you set this to this variable, the switch. And here, for example, you define a box for open boundaries and one box with at length 10 at orthogonal uh, D2 for uh, Python. So this is the same code. Python just now that the box size is different. Okay, and this is a different size of the box. It's just one. So this would give you a box centered around the origin <coughs> 0.0.0 with uh, a total size of one. So you would have boundaries at 0.5 and minus 0.5. <coughs> Another thing is that, yeah, what I didn't mention is that the code is automatically 3D. So you always have uh, three-dimensional setup. Um, okay, collision detection may be also fast here. <clears throat> you can uh, give your particles also a certain radius if you like, and then the code can derive if particles co collide. You can then decide what happens during collision. You can decide between inelastic collisions, elastic collisions. You can also trigger extra external functions that you code if a collision happens. This is, for example, what we do in, an, uh, in our code that merges rebound with an SPA simulation. I've got an example for this later on. Uh, and then you, there is also the possibility to uh, use the tree for collision detection. This is probably faster. Default is that there are no collisions happening. <clears throat> so you have point masses, no collisions. Uh, second is collision direct, where brute force at every time step, you, there, there is search for overlaps. If you give your particles uh, certain radii, then the code searches for overlaps of these radii. <clears throat> then there's a collision line. There, the code checks if during the last time step, particles have traveled away uh, that overlapped. So in the collision direct approach, just at the current time of your time step, the code checks if the particle overlap. If the for the rep collision line, the code checks if the particles maybe have overlapped during the last time step, during the time step, and the collision, yeah, collision tree is when when the op tree is used to detect overlap of your particles radius with the nodes uh, of the other particles. So the, the, the particles are um, sorted into the tree which gives you hierarchical structure and each particle has a radius, each node, so to say, has a radius and you can detect which node overlaps which with which particle. So you can track all these collisions and then you can decide between a different collisional outcome, fully elastic, inelastic, merging, which conserves mass, momentum and volume, and this uses a defined function. Okay, you, you, you see I'm speeding up here because this is just, um, it's better than, it's better if you do it yourself afterwards. There's some useful functions in rebound. For example, you can have a heartbeat function. Uh, and this is a function uh, which is called by uh, rebound automatically for each and every time step. Uh, you can define this, for example, this can be nice in C to well, just um, print out the energy of the system or to write out in this case, here we have a heartbeat function, oops, sorry. We have a heartbeat function here that just checks uh, an interval of 1000 time units um, uh, and prints out the current time. Or you can then do probably write down the files and the particles positions also. So with this heartbeat function, you can, can always control and see, monitor your um, simulation. And this is just done by a function pointer. So your, the structure has a function pointer to this function, 
and in this function you can do whatever you want. This works also. Uh, I've just an example here for um, C, but this works also in Python. Then we have functions for I/O, so you can uh, directly write out the particles, positions, and velocities to an ASCII file. You can um, append them um, here. This is what we know here. So this function would write out the orbits um, with all orbital parameters, so semi-major axis, eccentricities, inclination, um, um, mean anomaly, and, and so on, every 1,000 time units interval, and appends this to a file called cool orbital data, whatever. Um, and you have many more functions. There are functions to calculate the energy in the system, functions to calculate uh, the angular momentum. You can convert between different coordinate systems, yeah, let's say Jacobian, or um, standard um, position and velocities. Um, there are also more celestial mechanics related functions. You can always access the information about the time and the time step. Mm. And uh, this was one question um, in, in, the, in, the, in the chat. Uh, if there is um, functions for to create initial particle distribution, there is one function to create plumber spheres. I guess there are also other functions for different uh, kind of um, random distributions, but I'm not sure. I would have to look at the documentation. So, um, what I've told you also, there's a, a poop function to add additional forces. So this is also a function pointer that you can set and points to a specific function that you can write for yourself, which adds additional force uh, terms to the standard, um, the standard accelerations, gravitational acceleration. So here's an example from uh, from the examples directory, so this is directly from the, the rebound repo for the pointing Robertson track. So we have here the track from, from the pointing Robertson effect from the sun, solar, uh, from the uh, solar radiation. And we have here, have to state that this force is velocity dependent, because otherwise uh, rebound thinks um, we have a separable Hamiltonian. So we have to tell this force is special, it depends on the velocity, and then we can set, we have an additional force which is given by this function, and we describe this function here, and just add here uh, for particles that don't have a mass, a special acceleration, which depends on the velocity here, and gives us uh, an acceleration. This is just the formula for the pointing robertson effect. And so in, in this way, you would add up additional uh, forces to the code. And of course, now, if you're using a, the Python version of the code and you did describe this uh, function now at the Python function, then the Python function itself would be slow, because Python, in a sense, is slower than C. So then it's really, it's advisable to either use a Cython version of this function, okay, which means the, the uh, compiled Python version of the function, or to add a pointer to a C version of this function, just because it's much faster. Um, okay, I've got here one example from, from my group here, what we do with a postdoc, Christoph Burger here in Tübingen, he does late stage accretion simulations. Um, so, in principle, the last 150 million years of a um, planet, planet, planet formation, where you have a sea of planetesimals and already the big uh, gaseous planets, and you have um, accretion between the planetesimals on the long term evolution. And we use rebound, where we simulate the sun. Jupiter and Neptune, then we have a sea of planetesimals 
between uh, in, in the now S-joint belt. Uh, and we simulate this with rebound. And every time a rebound catches a collision, detects a collision, we start automatically an SPH simulation where we calculate the collision of the two bodies. You can see, maybe you can see this here. This is a video. I don't know if this plays well. You can see here two planetesimals or planetary cores colliding. And the different colors here mean different materials. So each of these um, planetesimals or planetary cores is built up of a, a, an iron core, a silicate mantle, and then a layer of uh, water or ice on top of it. And what we study using this um, code is now the water transfer during the late stage creation phase. So this would be a single um, collision, so to say. And this would be now the whole simulation with rebound. You see here we start with the C of planetesimals between 0.3 wow, uh, AU and 4 AU with a different mass fraction of the planetesimal. Here we have um, Jupiter, Neptune, and the Sun here. This is also a video. I don't know if this plays well. Um, but you can see here the time evolution of these planetesimals, and you see they collide, they merge, they lose or gain water. Uh, and the whole simulation goes, I don't know how long this goes, we are now 50 million years. And in the end, we end up with several planets with a specified water mass fraction. Okay, so the evolution is done with rebound and the collision is simulated with uh, SPH. This is automatically done uh, and afterwards the remaining or the, the, the two biggest objects remaining of the collision simulation are put back into rebound. <laughs> okay, we'll come on to the question later. There's a paper on it. Okay. Um, Okay, but this is this is not done easily and straightforward. So this was a bigger pro project of Christoph Burger, but uh, I can give you the referent of the paper later. Okay, so so far we will now start with the exercises. Let's look at the time. It's twelve o'clock. Maybe Christoph, uh, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, maybe it's better if we have, uh, I don't know, a break, because I, I know that it's lunch time in Germany. So if you prefer a break, well, that uh, that's completely okay here. I'm fine. I guess we would, we would just have to decide if we continue now or if we uh, do the SPH session. I don't know. I, uh, I think everybody's exhausted now of the theory. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, uh, I think, uh, is it okay if we have uh, some questions here? Yeah, sure. I have a break time. Uh, well, uh, Hamid Reza here asks uh, uh, multiple questions. So, uh, okay. the, the first question uh, on slide 64. Uh, okay. He says, uh, so it means the leapfrog is not suitable on a slide 64. The, the question is, for what is it suitable? Yeah, I mean, this is a second order integrator. This is very fast. Um, this is suitable um, for a lot of applications, as long as you don't have collisions, let's say. And uh, as you will see in the exercises, this gives already good results. I mean, um, and moreover, for example, the second order integrator is what people use in all hydro codes, because normally the order of in the hydro codes from your from your partial differential equation scheme from your um, discretization there is uh, uh, second order. Okay. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Sara follows up uh, on that question and uh, she says, um, 
following up uh, following above question in which condition a time reversible integrator is preferred I think this is um, for example if you had I mean this is the the highest accuracy that you can get in principle I mean this means that you have the best energy conservation so I don't know I, I would have to look at the the paper what was the special application of this Janus integrator uh, but I, I think that the thing was to show here that it's possible with integer arithmetic to implement an integrator that is uh, as accurate as could be so I mean even the truncation errors or the rounding errors that you do are, are in principle zero if you can reverse it yeah so you have no uh, no floating point problems let's say so I mean in principle it's about accuracy but I don't know any application for it honestly sorry Okay, thank you very much. And we have another question. Uh, Hamidos asks uh, on slide 93, where can we find the Cyton version, C-based <laughs> version? Okay, here, here this one. Uh, this is 93. I mean, um, I think that there, there is none, there's no Cython version. If you, but you know, what I wanted to tell you is if you use the Python version and you add functions um, written in Python, then of course these functions are slower compared to um, the C version or also compared to the integrator that you're using because the integrator is written in C. So all integrators, all the backends is written in C, that's why it's so fast, just the, the interface is in Python. So if you write a function in Python, you will automatically slow down all your uh, simulations. For example, if you add a track force just in a Python function. So you would write this Python function in a fast way, either complete in C or then in Cython. Um, but for Cython, you have to look at the documentation of this. Um, Sorry, I have no example for Cyton here in the slides. Okay, thank you very much. And the, uh, the next question, uh, he asked, uh, uh, Hamid asks uh, about the video uh, that you showed. How the SPH modules uh, and rebound can be connected? Is there any specific tutorial on that? No, there is not. I mean, this is also not part of rebound. This is just what we did here. In Tübingen, we have an open source SPH code. This is my love CUDA, which runs on GPUs. And we've connected these both codes for this. There's a paper on it, um, but there's I, the, the code itself is not public so far, I guess. I have to talk to Christoph Burger. Uh, but this was just to show you the possibilities that or the opportunities that you have with rebound and you can easily even uh, combine it with other um, um, numerical codes so to say I can put a link to the paper on it or I can even mail it to you Jose and then you can put it on the github repository thank you that would be great and our last question uh, Fatima asks, uh, if in collision, uh, how we how we enter a specific elements? I mean, how many elements can we uh, enter? What do you refer with elements? I don't know. Uh, well, uh, she explains mean F E H. I don't know. Okay. Um, maybe, uh, yeah, 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 maybe uh, she means chemical. Ah, okay. But you're referring now to the SPH collision, right? I think she... Uh, okay. 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 
Okay. Yeah. Sorry. No. The, the thing is that okay, this this SPH simulation is in principle has nothing to do with rebound. Okay. What rebound gives you is the opportunity to start your own function as soon as it detects uh, a collision. What we do, we have this function pointer that triggers then a function that calls an SPH simulation. And this SPH simulation is a sophisticated simulation on its own already because we, you have to build up an SPH particle distribution out of different materials. And we chose for our planetesimals or planetary cores or planets an iron core, silicate mantle, and an ice um, shell. And this is what is all handled on the SPH side. So, um, in principle, you could also add different uh, materials here in this planetesimal model. The thing is, how do you model a planetary core in a astronomical, uh, astrophysical correct way. And our model is just it's an iron core, um, hydrostatic equilibrium, uh, silicate mantle, and an ice shell. But this has nothing to do with the rebound part. Okay? Um, okay. Good. Uh, thank you very much again. And uh, I know that you're probably tired. So uh, the break time is completely up to you. Okay? We understand it. Just tell uh, tell us when we should come back and we will be here. Is it okay uh, 15 minutes or maybe 20 minutes? No, it's okay. Let's let's do uh, now. It's, it's we can continue at quarter to one. Uh, so no, in your time. So in 20 minutes, 25 minutes, 20 okay. minutes. Uh, so uh, we come back at 25 minutes. Okay, and then we can maybe let's do maybe we can do this. Kirkwood example because it's the more sophisticated one or I, I I'll prepare something and then we can do an example together. Okay, thank you very much. So okay. we should come back at uh, 3 10? 3 15, uh, 15. Yeah. So okay. your local time. I, I make a quick uh, comment here. Thank you very much and uh, we see you again. Thanks, Susie. Thanks.